What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of The Sheehan Show here on Shardog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and I am back with your top bets for the week in the world of mixed martial arts, and we have a massive card this weekend. The UFC goes back to New York, to Madison Square Garden. We have two title fights uh, topping the card. No champions, unfortunately, although two ex-champions. Um... With a vacant title and an interim title, obviously John Jones versus Stephen Miocic was supposed to be on this card, but we know what happened. John Jones got injured. No, but we go ahead with a good card anyway. So I have four bets from that card. I also have one bet from over in KSW. There was one that kind of stuck out to me there. Uh, the odds are up uh, as at the time of recording, so I said I'd throw it in as well here. But um, I'm going to have that in the middle today, so we'll start and end with UFC 295 when I get to this week's bets. Let me recap last week's bets first, even though maybe I, I don't really want to. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't the best week. It wasn't the best week ever. Uh, again, a fight fell out the day before uh, the the uh, the actual events happened. Um, So... Even though the fighter I did pick did win, I'm not taking that as a bit Jack Cartwright. He went from, I think, a minus 105 against Anton Rakic to, like, I just actually just checked it there before recording. It was, I think he was a minus 1100 or minus 1200 or something over his opponent that he did beat. So that's uh, that's unfair. I'm not taking that. That's null and void. On the other three bets, uh, only one of them, unfortunately, won. That was Cal Bahalio. He won his fight, obviously, um, pretty pretty well. I think I think he, he performed well apart from the end of the fight where I know a lot of people probably had him to win inside the distance and you know when you have the body triangle like that at the end of the fight and you don't get the finish I, I think people have a right maybe to be a little bit pissed off but other than that it was a good win in a good 15 minutes it was a good 25, 25 minutes for Jelton I made that but when you give him to win by submission and he could have submitted Derek Lewis three or four times at the start of that fight oh, I think we've all a right to be annoyed after that one but um Look, it was one of those ones, and I said it last week, like, Derek Lewis hasn't been submitted that many times, uh, but it looked like, you know, he could get a rear naked choke, possibly, but more more to the point, of, uh, probably an arm triangle, and that's exactly kind of how the fight went. He went for both of them, he didn't get either of them. Uh, I, I tried to predict it to a T last week. I tried to predict it in a second on Twitter, and it almost happened to the second, but uh, no, it's just... It, it turned into one of those fights where he was obviously going to win by submission to one where he's obviously going to win by decision uh, after he got so tired. I was like, no, I can't be going for finishes anymore. So, yeah, that was that. And then Denise Gomez against um, uh, Angela Hill. She didn't get the win there either, so that was unfortunate. Uh, and then over in uh, one championship, the flyer there, plus 400 bet for uh, Kang Ji Won, also didn't hit as uh, he ended up getting taken down and wrestled by his uh, his Canadian opponent over there. <sighs> Do you know what? I didn't factor in the fact it was in a ring, which I definitely should have, and it's it's one of those things you probably don't do twice. Um, and that's definitely a thing I won't do twice on this betting show. So apologies for that one. Although, do you know what? I lo- I was looking for the betting odds up until the last minute and I could not get that prop anywhere. I couldn't get the prop anywhere. So <coughs> thankfully you weren't able to bet it in anywhere. So hopefully no one was able to find the prop and no one did bet it. But we will, uh, we will take that L anyway. Right, the overall record now for the year. Jesus, lads, we've only a few weeks left. Um, 74 of 153 um, and 13 of the 38 overall on the um, on the flyers. So, yeah, no, I was happier with it a few weeks ago. Now it's kind of, it's looking, it's not looking the best, but look, we've had some good bets throughout the year anyway. And uh, I wanted to, uh, uh, I wanted to keep a record. And, you know, when we get to December 1st, we'll, we'll wrap it up. And, um, sorry, January 1st, we'll wrap it up December 31st and we'll start again anew for, uh, for next year. If anyone actually wants my list of bets and the price I have, I actually have them. So I think it's, it's probably too long to put in the description or anything. So if you want to just get in contact with me and I literally send you the list of, of all the bets I had, if you want to double check them from the year. So I actually have them here. So it's, uh, it's easy to do that. So if anyone wants them, let me know and I can send you all the, uh, all the past bets. All right, let's get to this week. And let's get to the first fight. And this is my this is my best bet for UFC 295. Um, and it's one of those bets that the second I saw the price, I'm like, I, ha- I just have to give that. I just have to give that. And 
It's one of those ones, like a lot of times I, I look at Sherdog, I look at the records, I say, oh, like that person has won loads of times by submission, that person has won loads of times by knockout, you know, they're on a good run, and, and, and you know, a lot, of, a lot of that, but didn't tape work and all of that. This one was, I have to, I have to give that bet. I have to give it. And people might be surprised that it's Jessica Andrade or plus 150. And the reason I'm giving that, and obviously she's fighting McKinsey Dern. I, I think the reason is twofold, right? Um, and I was chatting to, to Graham over the Severe Met podcast about this, and he made the point, and then this is maybe a threefold point, but he made the point that Jessica Andrade is coming off of three losses against three very, very good people. It's like, almost of course she's not going to be a favour for her next fight. And that that does make a lot of sense. It's, it's almost a case of, like, no matter who she's fighting, she wouldn't be a favourite for it. Now... Now, not being unfair on McKinsey Dern or anything, no, I think she's a good fighter. I think she has shown signs of improvement at times. But I, I just think she hasn't shown enough big signs of improvement to say that she can hold her own at the very, very top of the division. Like, you look at her win. Like, her, her best win for me at the time was Nina Nunes back in 2021. She lost to Marina Rodriguez after that. She beat Tisha Torres, which is a very good win as well. She beat Yan Jonan, or sorry, she lost to Yan Jonan uh, in a relatively close fight, and she, lost, she beat Angela Hill. You know, she did a great job and beat Angela Hill pretty well, but, you know, Angela Hill, Angela Hill is Angela Hill. She's not a top-level fighter. Now, she, look, Vierna Jandaroba, that win is getting better and better looking all the time. It's I'm not saying that McKinsey Dern is no good or useless or can't reach a level or anything like that. At 30 years of age now, it's probably still a few more years improving in her possibly, you know, considering she only made her debut in 2000 and, what, 2016, so seven years, you know, she's probably has another couple of years to, to reach her prime. Um, but I haven't seen the big important um you know, moves forward in her game that would suggest she can hang at the very, very top. And to not no, not to say that Jessica Andrade is any longer at the very, very top, but look at the, look at the people she has lost in her last week. Suarez, uh, Yan Jonan as well, obviously the, the same and lost more comprehensive to her. I don't think she has improved. And and Aaron Blanchfield as well, who's one of the top people in the world. Um I I just think it's so, here, here's my thoughts on it, right? How does McKinsey Darn win this fight is the first question we should ask ourselves if she's the favourite and if you're betting on her coming into this, right? How is she going to win the fight? Well, you look at McKinsey Darn's record. She has 13 wins, 7 submissions, and 6 decisions, right? Which is obviously very, very good. Um, you look at Jessica Andrade's uh, record, she's 12 losses, 5 knockouts, 4 submissions, 3 decisions, right? So, yeah, she could submit her, she could, she could decision her, or whatever it might be. Right. Is she going to take her down easily and beat her up in the ground and submit her? Um, I think from what we've seen in both of their games for the last few years, even adding in the bad part from Jessica Andrade, I don't know someone, sorry, I don't know if someone with McKinsey Dern's wrestling skill set can actually take a Jessica Andrade down that easily to dominate her on the ground. Like, if she does get to the ground, look, McKinsey Dern is one of the best jiu-jitsu players we've ever seen in MMA, and she can do bad things to anyone once the fight gets to the ground. But can she get the fight to the ground? That is my big question there, right? Can she and and once she gets her to the ground, can she immediately submit her, or you know, she can she submit her in a couple of minutes or three or four minutes or whatever it might be? You know, what, what's your answer to that? Let me know your answer to that in the comments. My answer to that in the comments is the, to the first part. I don't think she can dominate her and then take her down all the time. Now, it only takes one. If the first one is good, that'll do, right? But we're talking overall here. We're talking, like how many times we analyze fights and we talk about a 25 minute fight and it ends in seven seconds. <laughs> you know, it happens all the time. So, you know, but we have to talk in, in generalities here when we're talking about this. I think she's going to find it somewhat hard to take Jessica Andrade down. And even if she does take her down, I think Jessica Andrade has the ability to survive for a period, right? Um, and then we look at the next part of it. How is it going to look on the feet? Like, I think McKenzie, McKenzie Dern is one of these fighters that 
Sometimes she comes out and she looks like the Jason Burlow student who has a jab and has a big right hand. Remember, was it the random Marcus fight? Watch fight was it? She, she knocked her opponent down hard with that right hand. But we haven't really seen much of that since. We've seen the hands look good at times and in another fight, not really. And in the next fight, yeah, is it coming back again? It's, I think there's just too much of the unknown with McKinsey Dern. Right, there are improvements at times and not improvements at other times. Has there ever been a big, massive improvement to world level? I don't think so. I don't think so. Is Jessica Andrade still at world level? I, I, I'm not sure in terms of the people who are at world level. But then you have to ask yourself the question, is McKinsey Dern at world level? And then you have to ask yourself the question, if Jessica Andrade goes down slightly from world level, will she start to win? Or keep losing. And my opinion is she'll start to win again. <laughs> so so there you go. If you can if you can if you can keep along with that thinking that I I went through in my brain there, hopefully you can. But that's kind of my thinking. I also right, the second part of, of the, the, the uh the two part theory here is okay, first part obviously maybe find it hard to take her down, maybe not immediately immediately submitter, but if she does trouble. On the field, I think Jessica Andrade if she opens up, if she throws a few strikes, once she stops a couple of takedown attempts or throw attempts or whatever it might be, I think she can have big success there. I really do. Like, I think McKinsey is someone who will throw her shots knowing that, like, if something mad happens, she can end up uh, on top or on the bottom or whatever it might be on the ground with her opponent. But that's all well and good until the fight draws out into a 60-second fight on the feet, a 90 second fight on the feet, a three minute fight on the feet, a full round on the feet. And then you have to go through all of that with Jessica Andrade. Like, are you good enough to get through that against Jessica Andrade on the feet? And what if that goes the full 15 minutes like that? I I don't know. I, I don't know. I just, I favor Jessica Andrade here. Like this, this is the fight, right? That if she loses, I don't think she's ever going to reach that top level again. At 32 years of age You know we've seen where people say like Look the, the two examples of people Who've gone each way are Jose Aldo and Hinnambarau Right Hinnambarau reached the stage Where it just kept going down And down and down and down Jose Aldo he obviously got knocked out By McGregor And then the um, Holloway Losses happened But after McGregor knockout He came back and he just Destroyed Frank Edgar After Holloway losses He re- rebounded uh, Again he came back And he fought for the title uh, uh, Or you know was Should have been fighting For the title Or whatever it was At um, at 135 You know So You can go one of two ways for, In my op- My call My call And my opinion for this fight Is Jessica Andrade Is going to win it And she's going to Stop the takedown Initially And I don't think It's going to be too hard and I think she'll win on defeat. And if she's careful, if she's careful throughout the 15 minutes and doesn't get taken down and doesn't find herself in a scramble where she is controlled and lets um, McKinsey Dern dominate her there, I think she'll win the fight. She's the avoid, obviously, that big right hand as well from McKinsey Dern, but if she does, I do like her in this fight and I do think she will win. So that's bet number one for the week. Jessica Andrade plus 150. Bet number two is my KSW bet, so I'm going to give it to you here and now. Um, and it's Bartosz Lesko in the middleweight division, and he's fighting Pieter Kuberski uh, in their fight, uh, and he is minus one ten. So he's actually um, he's actually the favorite. His opponent uh, is minus one twenty, but obviously very very close. That could change again before the uh, the fight actually happens. Um, I have a preview out on this uh, card. Uh, I'm not sure if it's out yet or anything, but it will, it will be out. Um, and I, I kind of talked through the fight in that. And in my opinion, there's two different sorts of fighters here. And one with, I think, an advantage in stealing rounds or finishing fights. And that is Lesko. And I'll tell you why. Lesko is the big, strong Long jab, fast counters type of guy who's, I, I described it on the preview as gangly, but it works for him. And Kuberski is your normal fighter, right? He throws his jab, he throws his backhand, he, you know, he doesn't really switch stances all that much. Um, he, you know, he's a good, solid fighter that will beat almost anyone on, you know, the local scene on the way up because he is solid and technical and good, right? 
but I think the difference here is let and let uh, I talked about Lesko in the previous well. Uh, you wouldn't call him you you wouldn't call either of these lads like the definition of athletes. You know, if you're looking for one of them, go on uh, <laughs> the fight that, that's above it on this car. Uh, Patrick uh, Kaczmarczyk, a, a proper athlete, like a, a proper, proper athlete. These, these lads aren't it, but you know what Lesko is? He is a guy who uses his kind of, his size, his shape to be a really good fighter. Like, he uses that lint to kind of throw the jab out there, but he's the, the quick counters inside when someone tries to break through that are almost as useful. It's almost a guy using his size to entice someone to come inside and break that distance, where he's actually better a small and a far a small. Sorry, fighting a smaller man's fight. He's really good at it. And I, I think it'll be one of those short right hooks inside that does for Kuberski here. I, I, don't think it'll, I don't think it'll be a longer fight more than likely, and I think he could win by decision. But I really do like him. I think he will land a better shot. I think he's more able to control him. And as I said, when you're looking for a fight that's too evenly enough to match fighters like this, what's the key going to be? And I think the key is the guy who can land a bigger shots the more, you know, the, the shots that the judges are looking for, really. The ones with the more most power, the ones with the most effect, and I think that's Leshko. So I'm going for him as my second bet of the week at minus 110. The third bet of the week is almost the exact opposite in terms of logic <laughs> to, to that one. And I'm going for uh, Marco Madsen to win his fight against Jared Gordon. Now, I, I think it's, it's a slightly similar logic to the, the main event and he's plus 163 so when I see that price I like that price uh, Marco Madsen lost his last fight to Grant Dawson um, obviously Grant Dawson has lost pretty comprehensively since then to, uh, to Bobby Green but up until that point he's looking really 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 good and obviously Mark Madsen O stands for Olympian uh, he was a wrestler and he came in against a guy in Grant Dawson who is I suppose not, not necessarily a better wrestler but a, maybe a better MMA wrestler and a younger <laughs> you know a younger guy who can maybe do the things that you could have done better 10 years ago but maybe maybe not necessarily now at 39 years of age um, whereas Gar- Jared Garden at the other side of it um Obviously, he fought uh, Bobby Green similar t- similarly to um, to Grant Dawson, but that was a no contest, and on that fight didn't happen. And he fought Paddy Bimblet before that in a fight where, you know, everyone seems to think he won, right? And I I scored it for him in Ireland. It was a good performance, but I'm going to do a little bit of MMA math here because I think that's what uh, the betting odds have actually done. I think they looked at Jared Garden being competitive with Paddy Pimblett and arguably winning the fight and think, oh, Jared Garden's actually a different level. He's a very, very good fighter. I don't think Paddy Pimblett's a very good fighter is my thing here. So to be good against Paddy Pimblett, to look good against him, to be competitive against him, to beat him, shows you're a good fighter. Does it show you're a top-level fighter? Uh, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. We, we like we've seen Sarn back being him, Nadin Aramani. Would you call either of them lads top level fighters? Um, no, I, 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 both good fighters. You know, Sarn back especially has done good things, but I wouldn't. Right. So, and now that's very that's that's not me writing off Jared Garden. He's like he's a good solid, you know, blue collar fighter. There's no shred of doubt about that, and he's some good wins on his record, right? And he's fought some very very good guys. Uh, I'm purely talking about the betting odds here. And I'm purely talking about why he is that price now versus what this fight probably would have been before those two fights. Like, has Marco Madsen massively changed since, you know, losing to Grant Dawson? Um, you know, it's I suppose it is, it is a year ago now, so maybe, maybe that's a part of it. But I don't think he's too much worse. I think he's just probably going to be the same fighter. Is Gordon a lot better? I'd say probably, probably not. Right, so what I see here is a, is actually probably a pretty close fight where I would give Garden probably the benefit of it on defeat, but not a massive benefit on defeat. Because I think Marco Madsen is is good, uh, can box, can do all that, but when he gets you to the ground, he will you know, he'll keep you there and he'll make it a very, very tough night for you. And we saw, you know, in the Charter Garden fight where 
uh, with Paddy Pimlet where he likes to spend a lot of time against the cage and that's part of his game for the big fights. That's a dangerous game you're playing against Marco Madsen. I know, can you you know, keep going for 15 minutes strike when him winning all the time without giving up a takedown. I, I think that's going to be tough. Now he might. And, and, and like, he doesn't need 15 minutes. He pro- Do you know what? He probably needs about 10 minutes of that, to be honest, um, to, to make it a very, very, very close fight. But I just feel like, and I'm, I'm not going to lay take down and win the round here, but I just feel like there's going to have, there's going to be two close rounds in this. Right. And I feel like there's going to be like a takedown with 90 seconds to go. And Marco Madsen lands 15 shots on top that are not big or not massive or anything like that, but just sway it around. And I feel like that could happen twice, maybe three times, and get him to 29, 28, to 30, 27 here. And honestly, when I saw that price at plus 163, I was thinking that's, to me, the most likely outcome of this fight. If you get me... Minus 163, I probably would have gone gone for it as well. So at that price, I had to go for it. Plus 163, Marco Madsen to win in the third bet of the week. Right, the final two bets of the week are from the two title fights. So let's get straight into them here. First one from the light heavyweight uh, title fight. Um, this one... This one I was okay with. I struggled. I really, <laughs> really, really struggled for the heavyweight title fight to pick a bet, to be honest. But for the light heavyweight title fight, I've gone for the over one and a half rounds, which is minus 150. <coughs> um, I do think this is going to be a, a, not a, a, maybe a long fight, but I do think we are going to see a few rounds here. I think it'll probably if it. Do you know what my my first impression is that it might go to a decision, but I think third, fourth, fifth round type of thing. I, I do think it'll go a bit longer, and the reason for that, I think, is Yuri has been out for a while, and will take a little bit of time. I think to get that time and to get back into the fight, and I think Alex is a guy who always kind of works his way into fights you know he's a kickboxer and that's the way kickboxing is done you know we was watching a lot of one championship last week and we were talking about the Mai Tai guys mostly doing that but the kickboxing guys do it as well there's no no, no doubt about that and I, I just feel like Yuri is going to come out and he's going to throw a little bit of stuff early and you could see you know in the first two or three minutes and you are maybe even less than that one or two minutes and you're probably thinking Shani what, what are you talking about here um, but I feel like after that maybe it'll settle a bit and maybe there will be a little bit of like, okay, I'm going to work myself in here. Let's see what you're throwing. Not open up too much that be- big left hook and all the rest of the shots that come behind it from Pereira. Um, and I think if that does happen and it goes into that second round, you know, it's it's only a round and a half. It's only a round and a half here to go another, you know, two and a half minutes into the second round. I don't think that's a big stretch at all. So that's kind of my thinking on it, right? My thinking on, and, and that's very specific thinking, I suppose, for a bet. My thinking on the fight itself is a really, I'm really struggling with this one, to be honest. Because when you're a kickboxer like Pereira, you're very much, you know, you can maybe even harken back to uh, um, Tyson Fury uh, against Francis Ngano for this. It's almost easier to fight a guy who's fighting you normally. It's almost easier to fight someone who's very good than someone who's very unorthodox, right? Now, Yuri is very unorthodox. He's not maybe unorthodox for, for MMA or the most unorthodox fighter we've ever seen, although he is pretty unorthodox. But a lot of his recent opponents, whether it's Blahovic or, or uh, obviously Adesanya, uh, and even to a certain extent, um, Strickland, who might mightn't be orthodox for MMA, but is you know is a kind of a boxing stylist. Pereira can deal with them pretty easily, make his openings and land his shots. Now, you know, obviously he lost Adesanya. When I say pretty easily, I mean in terms of what he's trying to do. Will it be as easy to kind of predict what year he's going to do and to, to set up those shots and land those shots? Um, I don't think so. Now, if I play into the first point about Yuri not going as mad in the first couple of rounds, maybe it will be. But at the same time, if he does that in the you know if he if he kind of plays it a little bit easy in the first round and the start of the second round and then turns it up a little bit i think it'll actually play into the fact that alex mightn't be able to time him if what he has attempted to time in the first round has now changed in the second third and fourth round if you get me so that that's the bet for minus 150 on on the overall fight itself i re- I, I really i don't know i don't know i think 
I think Yuri's madness eventually will show. I think he'll probably get a takedown in there at some stage, whether it's him just kind of falling over him or, <laughs> or something like that. Uh, he has been in the big long fights. You know, I know Alex has as well, but not not to the same extent. I, I, I'll go for him, but not with any great certainty. And I, that's not one of my <laughs> bets of the week, but <coughs> the over one round and a half is a minus 150. Right. The last bet of the week, the flyer. And this is a proper flyer. This is a proper flyer this week. It's plus 1,000. And it's Sergei Pavlovich to win by TKO KO in round two. So that's my bet for this week. I struggled badly to get a bet out of this. I went back and I watched, like, the problem with going back and watching these fights, right, is you watch the Pav- Pavlovich fights, and I was looking on, on Fight Pass, there was maybe six fights, and there was one seven minutes, four seconds, nine minutes, eight seconds, five minutes, four, and this is the the, the fight video. This is, you know, the, the, the fight event video. This is not just the fight itself. The fight itself, all the fights themselves are like two minutes, one and a half minutes, four minutes. There really isn't much there. There really isn't a whole lot there. And you're probably saying, Shawnee, then why are you giving us a round two knockout bet, right? <coughs> well, it's a flyer. <laughs> it's, it's the main reason. But also, I think Aspinall is a good fighter. Pavlovich is a good fighter. Usually when you're a good fighter fighting another good fighter, it's not as easy as you when you're fighting, you know, the number 11, 15 ranked guys as you are fighting the number 4, 3, 2. And the other side of that is, I don't think either of these guys have ever fought to that level before. Like, usually when we see guys get to a title fight, and I know this is a an interim title or whatever you want to call it, usually they have proven they can get there, right? Like, you know, if you're... Who's an example? Like Benny Larius, right? He was supposed to have fought... Uh, or he did, he fought Charles Oliveira last time out. If he had beaten Charles Oliveira, by God, he's fought the level to fight at the very top, and you see him going into a title fight, and that's not, you know, that's not a big issue. Look at, uh, Drake is Duplessis, great example. He's fought Robert Whitaker. We know he can fight at the very top level. He's going into the title fight now, not a big issue, right? Neither of these guys have fought and won at that level. Like, Curtis Blades, as as good as he is, he's not a, you know, he got beaten by everyone who's who's got to that level. To Ivasa, Lewis, Abdurrahimov, all of those guys. Um, uh, the one guy he did fight was, was Overeem, and he lost that fight. Uh, but Overeem's also never met that level. Aspinall, very similar thing. Tabora, no. You know, we can obviously write off the Blades one in terms of the fight itself. Volkov, Spivak, Arlovsky. I know Arlovsky was a former champion and all, but, you know, we're talking about 2021 here and loads of other people. So they've never, they've never fought someone. Steve Miocic, John Jones level, that level. The problem is there aren't that many people there. There's the two of them and Silganya, Francis Ngannou, and no one else. So that is definitely an unknown when you're looking at this, right? So you have to be, you have to be careful what you're saying there. Like you have to. I'm looking at this and I'm kind of saying, right? Pavlovich has just ungodly power. But watching his fight, let me just check which fight it was here that I was watching a minute ago. The Blades fight. Curtis Blades caught him a ton of times. It, it, and it only lasted three minutes. He caught him loads inside. If Aspinall catches him a similar sort of way, it could be very well good night. And Aspinall, like, uh, uh, Aspinall's a guy I have liked so much down through the years, obviously coming from Cage Warriors and all I've watched. I've always wanted him to slow it down a little bit with Aspinall. And now he finds himself you know, in a title fight, coming off a knee injury in 2022 that he only came back from in the middle of this year. And, you know, is it all a bit quick? Who knows? But I'm still, at, at 30 years of age, I'm still not sure that Aspinall is at his prime yet. And it's, it's weird. It's a funny thing to say because if someone's listening to this, they're thinking, "Ah, Aspinall's only you're only Aspinall hate or something." But I think Aspinall could be the best heavyweight in the world now, right? But I think if he is going to be that, I think it's more likely in two to three years. And at heavyweight, you get rushed there a lot quicker. Like look at Benil Larry, she wasn't rushed there lightweight. Ian Gary, if he gets there, he's not going to be rushed there at welterweight. You know, if you're Aaron Lallan, he wasn't rushed there at, at 145. It doesn't happen, right? But at heavyweight, it does. And I just I just wonder which one of these guys is that. And I, I really, really don't know. So on the bet, here's my, here's my logic. I think it's going to be a 
uh, a slower, more um, watchful pace in round one. And how long will that last? I don't know, right? It'll last probably as long as someone lands a big shot and they finish him. Or someone will land a big shot and they'll get a lot slower, a lot more <laughs> quickly, and there'll, there'll be someone kind of looking to survive, right? But my thinking on the bet, and like, it, it, this is a genuine flower, a flyer at plus 1,000, um, is that they will be a bit slower in the first round and open up a little bit in the second round. And who has more power? It often comes down to that at heavyweight. I think Pavlovich has more power. I think Pavlovich takes more shots. And Aspen is probably a better technical all-round fighter. But sometimes that doesn't matter at heavyweight. Sometimes it's the power that matters most. And that's what I'm going for. And that's the big here. There's also an- another thing. So just the last thing on this. I've talked to a good few people about this. And there seems to be this like um, general accepted fact that Tom Aspinall is a very very good grappler and if there's someone taking someone down it'll be him and if there's someone submitting someone it'll be him submitting Pavlovich um and honestly I don't know if that's true or not I know he's good jiu-jitsu I know he's good on the ground and all but I haven't seen a whole ton of Pavlovich there in his UFC run right I haven't seen a whole a whole ton of him there you look at his wins zero wins by submission it's all knockouts you know 15 knockouts and, and three decisions so we haven't seen it at the, at the top level anyway but does that mean it's not there who knows like who knows I think I think that's the, something I would like to find out here uh, will we find it out maybe not but there seems there just seems to be that accepted willingness to believe that out there and I'm not sure if it's true I'm not saying it's not true but I do I think it's something that remains unanswered now it could be answered Saturday night and we will see on that but um yeah I just as I said I think it'll be a slower first round and I think I'm just back in the power in the second round I, I don't know I don't know I've watched a good bit of both of these lads and I haven't got a massively a brilliant read on it but that's what I'm going for let's have a look at uh, at some of the other bets for the weekend um I'll just have a quick run through a few of the KSW fights uh first of all um as I mentioned, Lesko and Kuberski, minus 120 for the favourite Kuberski. I'm going for Lesko, a minus uh, 110. I mentioned the, the Daniel Rukowski uh, and Patrick uh, Kakmarczyk fight. Uh, Daniel is a big favourite there, minus 333, plus 225. I think that will go uh, that way as well. We've Anita Bekus at uh, plus 250, minus 350, Maria Silva. Um, you know, that's, again... I spoke a lot about that on the um, uh, on the the previous show. I'm thinking, you know, may, maybe the underdog is the uh, <laughs> maybe the underdog is the way to go in, in that one. When you when you uh, you know when when you're looking at maybe they're not the most experienced uh, fighters in the world. Um, maybe Beckus is, is the one to go for uh, in that uh, Enrique De Silva in the heavyweight division he's the underdog at plus 180 against Martin Wojciech uh, De Silva obviously has been around for a, a good long time um, Wojciech is is experienced as well though you know um, he's you know fought in PFL fought in FEN you know, I, I, I would probably lean towards Wojciech there, but who knows in that one. Uh, and those are kind of the, the main ones there. The, the main event, obviously, is uh, Rukowski against Kek Marczak, and I'm, I'm going for Rukowski on that one. Right, UFC 295. Um, some of the undercard ones there, Lupi Godinez at minus 170 uh, is probably my pick against Tabitha Ricci, plus 140. Uh, Nazim Sadikov against Varoslav Boroshev. Boroshev... This let me just check this bet in here because this has changed. Yeah, Barashev was plus one thirty when I looked at it uh, earlier on in the week, and he's plus one ten now. So he's come in. I liked him at plus one thirty. At plus one ten, I'm not too sure. Like Barashev is one of these guys that I have a lot of time for. I think he's a very good fighter, but he's given up some ones recently that you probably wouldn't have expected him to give him up. But if the price goes out again to plus one thirty, I'd probably go for it at plus one ten. 
I'd probably leave it behind to be honest. Um, John Castaneda minus one four five plus one twenty for Young Ho Kong. I'd probably go for Kong in that one to be honest. Um, Joshua Van against Kevin Borjas. Van the favorite minus two two five. Um, Jamil Emmers is also the favorite at minus two fifty against Dennis Bazooka. I think that's about right as well. Like Bazooka is one of these guys who came in with this great reputation, but on chart notice in these last fight, will we see the real guy here in this one? Uh, if we do, that plus two hundred could look very good. So you know, maybe lay that one. Maybe maybe that's one you you look at a little bit more closely. There, the straight up prices of the um, I'll, I'll touch on the top two in a second. Uh, Steve Arsega at minus 190. I really like that price against Alessandro Costa at plus 155. I like Pat Sabatini as well. This fight is just about even here, everyone. Minus 115, minus 105 for Diego Lopez. I was talking to uh, Aaron Bronson on a podcast there last week, and he really likes Lopez. I really like Sabatini. It's a toss of a kind fight here, but I- I'm going to lean with Sabatini. Frivola and Saint Denis. Uh, the knockout prop isn't up in this one yet, but I love the knockout prop, whatever the price is. The under minus uh, 150, the under around and a half. Ooh, yeah, I, I like that. I think someone's getting knocked out here. I'm not too sure, to be honest. Frivola has pulled out a few upsets before, but Saint Denis is a different level. He's a very, very good fighter. Plus 180 for Frivola, minus 225 for Saint Denis. I see in one place here it's plus 195 for Frivola. If that goes out to plus 200, I would be betting on it. He started out plus 140, so the price is gone out. Hold out until Saturday night. See if that's plus 200. And if it is, I wouldn't mind taking a shot on that myself. Uh, Andrade and Durndin, as I mentioned, at plus 150. Um for uh for Andrade and uh minus let me just check here minus 180 for McKinsey there and obviously we spoke a lot about that and in the top two fights minus 115 for Aspinall who is the favorite uh, over Pavlovich minus 105 um yeah I think he's a favorite and is he a favorite in all of these books he is the favorite in all of these books yeah so very very close uh but um Aspinall Aspinall is the favorite uh, and then the uh Pereira Prohachka fight minus 120 for Pereira plus 100 for Prohachka so Pereira is the is the favorite for there I wonder how much that has got to do with the injury and coming back and all from that let's look at another, another couple of bets maybe from those uh, two fights before we go um does the fight go the distance in Pavlovich Aspinall? Uh, plus 700, if you like it to go the distance. We had one of them last week. Uh, Aspinall by KO, TKO, plus 165, plus 120 for Pavlovich. I was looking at that, but if you're giving me a minus 105 straight up bet, I'll probably take that if I'm, uh, if I'm being honest there. And if you do believe in the Aspinall ground game, plus 350 for the submission there is not a bad one at all. Right, here's... Plus 210 for Asmal to win in round one. Plus 230 for Pavlovich to win in round one. Not bad bets there at all. I'm going for the round two bet. We'll see uh, how that one goes. And then some of the other props for uh, Pereira Prahachka. Um... Obviously, in that one, I have gone for the uh, the over one and a half rounds at minus uh, 150, but you fancy it to go a little bit longer, over two and a half rounds, plus 132. If you fancy it to go to a decision, plus 330. If you fancy it not to go to a decision, minus 530, which is a, a big enough price. Let me give you the, the knockout for Brahachka, plus 200. The knockout for Pereira uh, is plus 100, interestingly, uh, enough like if you do fancy Pereira to get it done that's probably a good bet but um, what about Pereira to win by decision plus 900 wow perhaps get to win by decision plus 750 so they're not expecting this one to go uh, to go to the end at all very very interesting prices there and we'll uh, we'll see how the cookie crumbles at the end of it too um, there's a big cage warriors card as well this weekend but the prices aren't out yet unfortunately for that um we, we, we'll see I, I like Matthias Figlak in that in his fight we'll see if the prices are out closer to it I like Will Curry as well in his fight and I like um, I like Emil Brown in, in the main event as well so maybe you can do a treble there or something like that I'm not sure uh, how big or small those prices will be yet but we can see on that one Right, just to recap the bets before I go, Jessica Andrade, first bet up, plus 150, minus 110 for Bartos Leszko over KSW. Marco Madsen to beat Jared Garden, plus 163. I'm going for the over, around and a half, at minus 150 in Yuri Brachka versus Alex Pereira. And I'm going for Pavlovich to win by a round two knockout at plus 1,000 at UFC 295 in this week's Flyer 
of the week. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please give this a like. Please subscribe to the Shardog YouTube channel. There's loads of great content coming out here. Three videos for me every week. Uh, UFC preview shows from the lads. We have the, the Fight Business podcast. We have one championship previews. We have PFL previews. We have Bellator previews for me and, and loads of other people as well. Interviews, all of that. Please subscribe and uh, stay tuned here at the Sherdog for even more stuff. My name is Sean Chien for Sherdog.com and I'll see you all next time.